The fourth video in this section on state space behaviours looks at behaviours linked directly to the eigenvalues, which we will call eigenmodes. Previous videos then focused on the solutions for initial conditions and a constant input for a state space model. So what we said was that for a model x dot equals ax plus bu, you could find a state transition matrix 5t, which gave you the dependence on the initial condition, and a step response matrix h of t, which gave you the dependence on a constant input. And we derived those matrices, so 5t was given as e to the at, and h of t was given as a inverse times 5t minus i times b. This video now considers what insight can we derive into these relationships by looking more carefully at the eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition. So you'll remember from a few videos ago that phi of t can be written as e to the at or unpacking it as w e to the lambda t v where w and v are the eigenvectors and lambda the eigenvalues. Let's look at this decomposition a bit more carefully then. So the matrix A can be written as W lambda V, where W are the eigenvectors, and we can separate those out as the first column W1 all the way up to the nth column, column Wn. The eigenvalues are diagonally on this matrix lambda, so we have eigenvalues lambda 1 down to lambda n, and the eigenvectors in V or left eigenvectors are written as rows. So we have V1 transposed, that's row 1, down to Vn transposed, that's row n. Now it's known that by definition, W times V gives you the identity. And equivalently, of course, that means that Vw is also the identity, because these are square matrices. And the final relationship, which you may find useful, is that A times an eigenvector equals lambda i times an eigenvector. The focus of this video is going to be on non-zero initial conditions and no input, so we're not going to look at the step response. Therefore, we're going to focus on this part of the response. So x of t is given by w e to the lambda t v times x of 0. And you'll notice we're not using the form e to the a t, and we're not using the form phi of t. So if I cross those, what we're saying is we can get some particular insights if we write it using the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. A reminder that we're also looking at cases with only distinct eigenvalues. If you have repeated eigenvalues, there are some subtleties which are rather messy without really adding a lot of extra interest. So we're passing on that detail. The initial condition, that's x of 0, can be projected onto the eigenvector. So with distinct eigenvalues, we know that the eigenvectors span the space. And therefore, we can write any initial condition as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. So I can find an alpha 1 to alpha n such that this expression holds. Now, it's also straightforward to show that the relevant coefficients can be determined as follows. So alpha i equals v i transposed x of 0. And you remember, these v i's are the rows of the v matrix. If you want to prove this, then just substitute this identity into here. And you will get the following. You'll see you get w1 v1 transposed, w2 v2 transposed, all the way up to wn vn transposed times x of 0. And that can be rearranged to be written as w times v times x of 0. But we know that w times v is the identity. So the nice thing here, we can express the initial condition as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. And the relevant coefficients can be written down by inspection using that relationship. Now, given a state space model is linear, superposition can be used to determine the overall response. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use superposition by looking at the projection of x of 0 onto each eigenvector in turn. So we'll do the response on one eigenvector and then add it to the response of another eigenvector and so forth. So just a reminder, we're splitting up the initial condition into 
components along each eigenvector and then we're going to look at each of these components one at a time. And there's a reminder of what the overall response is but what we're going to do is we're going to plug each of these components in for x of 0 one at a time. We're not going to do them all together, we'll do them one at a time because that will give us some insight. So let's analyze each component in terms. So there's the x of 0 again, there's the definition of the alpha, and there's a reminder of some other properties. vi transposed wj is 0 if i is not equal to j, and vi transposed wi is 1. Um, obviously the i's are the same there. So let's have a look at what happens if we take only the first component here. So only alpha 1, w1. So you'll see I've said that the part of the response due to that component I'm going to call z1. So we've got the w e to the lambda t times v times alpha 1, w1. Now I'm going to use these relationships here. Vi transpose wj is 0, Vi transposed um, wi equals 1 and you'll see I've got a Vn transposed w1 and so on times w1 and those are going to give me 0. All those terms are going to give me 0. So when I do that you'll see it reduces to w e to the lambda t alpha 1 at the top and then lots of zeros and therefore Z1 reduces to W1 which is the eigenvector 1 e to the lambda 1 t which is the associated eigenvalue response times alpha 1 so I get a very simple form from this component alpha 1 W1. Now let's do the same thing for each of these components here one at a time. And you won't be surprised if we say that x of t can be written as a response due to alpha 1 w1, a response due to alpha 2 w2, all the way down to response due to alpha n wn, and I've called those z1 to zn. And z1 we've derived is w1 e to the lambda 1 t alpha 1. zn is going to be wn e to the lambda n t alpha n. So I've got nice simple expressions for how x of t responds. So now what I can do is I can plug those in together and you see I get x of t is w1 e to the lambda 1 t alpha 1 plus and so on all the way up to wn e to the lambda n t alpha n. And this is a very nice form because what does it show you? It shows you the contribution or decay along each eigenvector direction. So this component is always in the eigenvector direction w1. This component is always in the eigenvector direction wn. So it shows you the contribution of each eigenvector to the final response. And how much of that eigenvector have you got? Well you've got e to the lambda 1 t alpha 1 or e to the lambda n t alpha n. So you can also see through the lambdas the decay along each eigenvector direction is linked to the corresponding eigenvalue. So an illustration of this is best done through several examples and then once you've seen the illustration you'll probably start to make better sense of it. First example then, I've given a matrix A, the eigenvectors W, the eigenvalues capital lambda and the initial condition. You'll see the initial condition up here x of 0. Now the first thing I do is take that x of 0 and express it as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. So you'll see eigenvector 2 is this dotted blue line and so this is the contribution of the second eigenvector. And similarly eigenvector 1 is this green line so this is the contribution along the first eigenvector. So we can work out the corresponding alpha 1 and alpha 2 and you'll notice clearly that alpha 2 w2 but alpha 1 w1 gives me x of 0. What I want to do now is see what happens as we run forward in time and it's probably best to do this using MATLAB and then we'll come back here in a minute. So if we find the MATLAB window there it is and I'll just get the figure up as well. So I've got this particular program called phase plane and that's the diagram you've just seen. So what I'm going to do now is run it forward in time and you'll see how the response moves. So there's 
after a certain set of time. And what you can see is I've got a certain movement along this eigenvector and a certain movement along this eigenvector. I add the two contributions together and I get the new point. Run it forward a bit longer, you get a certain decay along this eigenvector, a certain decay along this eigenvector. Add the two together, you get the new point. I do this again and you see the same pattern. I can keep doing this, keep running forward in time, and now you can see the phase plane trajectory x of t. And you can see how it's made up by looking at the contributions along each eigenvector direction. Now if I go back here, there's the plot that we've just seen, and what's the key point? x of t tends towards the eigenmode with the slowest convergence. So if I go back, if you looked at the two eigenvalues, minus 2, minus 1, so what have we got? We've got an e to the minus t along this eigenvector and an e to the minus 2t along this eigenvector. So basically the decay along this eigenvector is fast and the decay along this eigenvector is slow. And so what you can see is the contribution of W1 as a ratio is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, we're going to lie solely on the eigenvector 2 direction. So there's your two formula. And you can see clearly that this term decays to 0 much, much faster than this term. And so as t goes to infinity, e to the lambda 2t will be much bigger than e to the lambda 1t, and therefore the component on the eigenvector 2 direction will be much, much bigger than the component on the eigenvector 1 direction. And you can see that by looking at this trace. You can see the trace is gradually going towards the eigenvector 2 direction. What happens then if we start from a different initial condition? So this is the same example, but I've started from a different point. So again, you can see my alpha 1 w1 is over here, and my alpha 2 w2 is over here. So again, I've got a linear combination of the two eigenvectors. If I run forward in time, you see exactly the same point. Eventually, I go towards w2. You can see as I get closer and closer to the origin, the state x of t is getting closer and closer to the second eigenvector direction, the one with the slowest behavior. And these are the sorts of insights that phase planes give you. Different example then, just for completeness. You'll see in this particular case, we've got different a, different w, different lambda. But again, you'll see the x of t tends towards the eigenvector with the slowest convergence. So the slowest convergence is associated to this eigenvalue, minus 0.4. And the corresponding eigenvector is this one here. And that is clearly this direction here. And what do you notice from your response, x of t? As time goes on, the x of t tends towards this omega 2 because you've got a fast convergence along this eigenvector and a slow convergence along this eigenvector. Now, what if just one of the eigenvalues corresponds to a divergent mode? Then clearly the trajectory will approach this asymptotically because if you've got a response like this and one of those um, lambdas has got a real part bigger than zero, then clearly asymptotically the limit as t goes to infinity of x of t is going to go solely to that one because that e to the lambda is going to infinity. So here's an example. We've started over here. There's your initial condition. And you'll see this particular mode is going to 0. So along w1, I'm converging to 0. However, along w2, I'm getting further and further away from the origin because that's got a divergent mode. So eventually, I will approach infinity along the second eigenvector direction. So the solution of a state space model has got n distinct modes linked directly to the eigenvalues. 
and that's how we might express it. So x of t has got a contribution from each eigenvalue, and that contribution is along the corresponding eigenvector direction. The coefficients alpha can be determined very simply from expressions like this. So the contributional decay along each eigenvector direction is linked directly to the corresponding eigenvalue. And so far we've considered only real and distinct eigenvalues.